All right, next up, I'm very pleased to say we have a team from Indiana University Bloomington. We have Stefano Fiorini and Adrienne Sewell, and they will be talking to us on an application of participatory action research and advising focused learning analytics. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> So I'll be starting, I'm Adrian, and I'm gonna be talking about the user side, um, the academic advising unit of the university division and our participation in this process. And Stefano will be talking about the research analyst part of this uh, particular process. <coughs> so our project was to um, assist advisors in helping students find successful course, course pathways through the curriculum, so to help students find their way to take the correct classes um, that they can be successful in. And to augment the knowledge that we already know academic advisors have, so they have tacit understanding, institutional knowledge, and this should be something that's adding to what they already have or bringing that forward. And we wanted to provide actionable information to advisors so that it would be something that advisors would find useful and that they would adapt to, that they would enjoy and find useful. So to give you a little bit of the background of the users, um, at Indiana University Bloomington, we work in University Division, which is our large undergraduate unit. So we have typically 8,000 to 10,000 students within our unit, and these students don't yet, they haven't yet been accepted into the major for their program. So they are still kind of exploring majors, and there are 350 different majors, and advisors are assigned 250 to 300 students, so fairly large rosters. Retention is very high at our institution, so typically about 91% of our students do succeed and continue on. So we have a smaller population um, that is at risk. One of the things that we do in advising is we do something called roster review. And this is when we're reviewing all of our roster of 350 students and trying to figure out who we need to contact between the time that grades have been final and they're also enrolled in classes. So we're looking at it and seeing, do they need to change their schedule? Do we need to send them certain resources? And there's a time crunch during that time. And sometimes it's hard. We're often using Excel spreadsheets or different kinds of filters to try to find the correct students. There's also various levels of advisor expertise. So in the past, in 2012, uh, the median years of um, of uh, time that an advisor had been at our unit was uh, nine years, and now it's down to about 3.5. So we have a bunch of new advisors that don't have as much institutional knowledge as some of the others. So in the past, um, we did um, bring on a vended product that had a predictive tool, and there were a lot of problems with that implementation, and part of it was that the black box approach. Advisors didn't trust what they saw, they couldn't interpret what they saw, because there was lack of transparency, it wasn't necessarily not accurate, an advisor just didn't know how to translate it. Also, there were predictions in all cases of all students for every major, and sometimes it, there wasn't really enough information to give a good guess as to whether a student would be successful or not in a particular major. Um, and that created a lot of distrust it, for advisors in what they were seeing. So sometimes things were accurate, but they didn't trust it. So um, from that experience, because we did find that there was some piece that was useful in what we used, it was just kind of lost in the other parts of it, um, that led us to take this participatory approach to development. <coughs> So um, our goal in this project um, to en enhance overall institutional knowledge was to build advisor trust in data and the understanding of predictive analytics, to foster research-minded advising so that advisors would be comfortable with using data and asking questions with data and kind of thinking in broader ways. And then also to build the analyst's understanding of advising processes and our, what our needs were, so that we're both learning something from that process. And then the aim, of course, is to create uh, a design, a user-centric prediction tool for analytics and insights. Um, so we want that to make sure that it seems, um, but it, that seems useful to advisors. <coughs> So um, about our tool, <clears throat> for our analyses, we were really interested in those students that are at risk of getting low grades in specific classes. And for a low grade for us is anything that's a C or below is considered a low grade. For us, that's only 12% of, of the students, only 12% of the classes are students getting that low a grade. 
Um, and we're interested in that because even just one low grade in a class can mean that a student is less likely to be retained. And we d we've done some research on our campus about that. So those low grades can really create a situation where a student doesn't continue. Um, we wanted to optimize the model to identify students at risk um, at getting those low grades and not focusing on the students that are doing well since so many of our students are doing well. So at the confusion matrix, we're concentrating bottom <clears throat> where both the predicted and the actual grades are ending up being low. So that's what we really wanted to focus on. And then that tool makes those recommendations to the advisor, but we're only seeing those <clears throat> um, that are um, ab above random so that we know that there is something, we have a conviction behind what it is we're showing. So if I'm an academic advisor, this is uh, how we're showing our data <coughs> for an advisor. So if I was an advisor with those 300 students, I might have 15 students that pull up um, in, in this system. And in here, those that are yellow, those are the classes that this particular student is taking that they're at risk in. So that's microeconomics at the top and um, environments and people down below. For the economics class, it shows that it's a repeat class. So as an advisor, when I see that, I then can go down here to the bottom. And I can see <coughs> that that student got an F the first time around. So that repeat class makes me make sure I'm looking down there. In the class environments and people, I might not, as an advisor, I might not have realized that that was a course that would be difficult for them because in the last time they took a class from that department, they actually got a C plus. But there are other grades and other parts of it that are then adding into the, the risk factor in there. It also shows here uh, both the term and the cumulative GPA, so I can see the cumulative GPA is not as low as the term GPA, so I can see that in a quick graph. And the course history is listed by low, average, and high grades, um, so this is a very different way for us to be looking at a transcript, and it gives us a really quick peek. Those that are in gray, those are classes that a student has not en uh, enrolled in, but they're at risk in. So if I'm thinking about planning, I can see quickly, okay, those are courses um, that a student is at risk in. Um, what I can also see from that is that if I'm, one, if I'm planning on changing my schedule, I can think about, okay, what class might I think that student maybe should avoid or maybe they need more tutoring. Now, if I had this information as an advisor, what I would most likely be doing is sending resources. So I'd say, you know, in that economics class, we have really good tutoring. This would be a good one for you. Or we might tell them to take the smaller version of the class where there are fewer students in the class. Um, in the SPIA one, we might be saying join a club for that major. Um, this might be a good time for you to see an instructor. So that's how we would be using the information that we've been given. And with that, I'm moving on to Stefano. So uh, why we adopted a participatory action research approach? Because uh, we wanted to uh, bring together research analysts uh, and uh, academic advisors and uh, um, enhance uh, and reveal the advisor's knowledge and use that knowledge and incorporate it in the learning analytic tools developed, uh, development, uh, at the same time achieving uh, a goal of uh, bridging uh, knowledge, uh, language barriers and build the understanding of uh, errors in the predictions so that we will have more buy-in uh, in the tools and uh, build trust in the de development process of the tools so that we could integrate uh, uh, more easily the um, needs of the advisors into the development of the tool. <coughs> and so in order to realize this participatory action research, uh, we adopted a cycle that uh, is uh, founded on uh, an initial uh, meeting of advisors and uh, analysts to define the scope uh, and of uh, the tool that ought to be developed, and uh, followed by a, a research phase. Um, this first uh, development phase then was uh, um, assessed uh, by an intentional uh, assessment uh, together with advisors uh, that applied a mixed approach, and the outcome of the assessment were there um, used to uh, uh, improve the learning analytic tools. And this uh, is uh, just part of a broader cycle uh, that, that led to what Adrian uh, just showed you. And so the participatory methodology 
uh, follow this definition phase uh, initial. And then uh, after the learning analytic tools was, was developed, uh, before an assessment was conducted, we hosted a series of focus groups that had the objective of uh, discussing with the advisors uh, the in and outs of the tools so that the black box and the issue of the black box with the black box and the limitation of the tools uh, uh, were discussed with the advisors. So a, a clear understanding of uh, uh, the tool was provided before uh, the tool was uh, going to be, to be assessed. Uh, and assessment uh, uh, consisted in uh, um, a random ra uh, feeding, the, uh, giving the advisors a randomly sampled uh, um, set of students with their enrollment and asking the advisors to evaluate uh, the risk uh, of the student in all those enrollments in the same fashion as they would normally do. And then uh, uh, they would, uh, were asked to explain uh, the reason for evaluating an enrollment risk. And so this provided us with both quantitative data that allow us to identify uh, overlaps between uh, the prediction of the learning analytic tools and the advisor own judgment, and also to kind of investigate the uh, reasons and the epistemolo epistemology that advisors use to evaluate uh, the risk of a student uh, in an enrollment. And here is a, a uh, first comparisons that uh, the quantitative data allowed us and uh, um, shows that uh, all those enrollments that resulted in uh, a grade above uh, F um, and uh, compares the advisor's assessment of an enrollment uh, with the prediction of the learning analytic tool. And highlighted there is uh, the overlap that we found between advisor evaluation and what uh, a, the learning analytic tool would evaluate it, would have evaluated, showing a strong uh, convergence also to advisors of how these, um, the tool could support uh, their work. Um, in this second quantitative assessment, uh, we then compare the student actual performance in a course and uh, what the advisors had predicted uh, or evaluated and the learning analytic tool prediction. And we see that uh, um, 59 percent of those courses that advisors had evaluated as being potentially at risk resulted there in a, a, a risk outcome, uh, while 87 uh, percent of the learning analytic tools uh, evaluated courses resulted in a, a, a risk outcome. But as uh, we see, uh, advisors also were apparently more conservative in evaluating a risk of a student while uh, the learning analytic tools cast a wider uh, net in uh, evaluating uh, or assessing risk. <coughs> the quantitative assessment was based on uh, uh, the explanation that advisors gave for uh, uh, assessing risk of uh, an enrollment and applied a grounded theory approach and was conducted uh, by two advisors so that uh, uh, teams were identified by advisors and codes uh, uh, were given and, uh, and the coding was uh, done by advisors so that we could have an advisor-centric assessment of uh, the um, evaluation uh, motivations uh, that they were providing uh, during the project. And uh, here with this simple uh, bar chart shows the distribution of the results of the code uh, the coding process and highlights how the performance uh, of students in similar courses um, is a, a, the most important uh, uh, team that emerged from, uh, from this coding. So advisors appear to attribute to performance in similar courses uh, great importance in uh, flagging a course enrollment at risk. And uh, also we see the quantitative uh, repeated courses with withdrawal so if a student has uh, issues of performance within certain areas, uh, sub subject areas, that lead to um, evaluating a, a course er enrollment at risk. The same is uh, overall um, performance of a student can be a potential flag, but not as much as uh, um, having performance specific issues within a, a subject. Uh, this is a simple, a simplified view of a the result of 
of the qualitative analysis. We also uh, analyze uh, the coding um, by looking at the co-presence of coding uh, within the, the attribution of risk uh, in the data. And you can still see here how similar courses are the most important and uh, how they are connected to other uh, forms of uh, performance in courses. So a student is withdrawing from a course uh, and that is similar to the one the student is currently enrolled, so that m the student might be at risk uh, in that course, uh, or uh, the student is repeating a course, so it's likely that the student uh, might be at risk in the course, or underperform uh, during a pro uh, in a prerequisite to the course. Uh, a strong co uh, connection we also see in the quantitative area, which appear to be the one that are most likely to be uh, predicted with a certain confidence. Uh, GPA, uh, so overall performance of the student or uh, uh, erratic performance of student from semester to semester um, is uh, important still, but not as connected to the various uh, other teams that were identified. And so from uh, uh, this analysis uh, that was then uh, integrated uh, with the learning analytic tools uh, further development, we can see that we're, there was a, a strong convergence between uh, what advisors, uh, the information advisors were using to evaluate the risk uh, in an enrollment and what uh, the data that was used by the learning analytic tools uh, for uh, uh, providing uh, the algorithms for providing this evaluation, uh, highlighting the potential need uh, the potential use of the, the learning analytic tools in uh, advising. And also help us uh, highlight uh, potential reasons for uh, avoidance that might affect uh, the tool adoption. So the presence of false positive, for example, <coughs> uh, might be a, or the, the um, tendency of advisors of uh, uh, evaluate a risk uh, in a more conservative way than uh, would be a recommender system or uh, a learning analytic uh, tool. And so uh, to conclude, I think uh, this uh, project uh, highlighted the importance of uh, the, and the, the potential of a, a participatory action research approach to develop a user center uh, identification of roles and development needs for uh, learning analytic tools because it can respond to data provision needs uh, an example is the contextual information that was provided uh, on the assessment of uh, risk and um, provide the uh, contextual information that advisors requires. Also help a promote, to promote a, a um, data-driven culture on campus with uh, advisors uh, inviting uh, analysts uh, to participate uh, in uh, meetings uh, of uh, an academic uh, research, uh, advising uh, research group the, that is a grassroots group uh, developing on campus, and also uh, feeding us uh, questions uh, and asking uh, support for uh, conducting various projects uh, on more specific questions that they face in the day-to-day -day, uh, interaction with the students. And in the end, uh, we think that this uh, allow us to anchor the tool development and assessment to an intentional advising practice. And this is it. <laughs> Under time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stefano and Adrian. So, who would like to follow up with some points? Working. Oh, thank you. And um, I love that how you're um, comparing your research uh, methodology with actual outcomes from the advisors. Um, you had a slide that you were comparing um, advisors' predict, um, like um, diagnosis versus actual student outcome, and um, you had your model diagnosis versus actual outcome. I'm wondering <coughs> if you looked into those actually st students that are ident diagnosed correctly by the advisor and by the model and see if there is any overlap or if that, because I'm thinking if, there, if there, there is a group that advisors can identify that the model cannot, and there, there, there is a group that the model cannot identify and advisor cannot, then a mix of these two would be great 
I, as an advisor, I see that, oh, the, it shows that this student is at risk, but um, I didn't realize that. But there is a student that I think at ri is at risk, and the model couldn't identify. So the combination would give you a high accuracy on precision, basically, on identifying at at risk students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, I see. I see the, the there are good reasons to uh, evaluate also known at risk uh, and uh, the the entire confusion metrics or uh, the overlap. Mm -hmm. uh, we intentional intentionally. Ah, we have it here. <coughs> So we are talking about here this. We um, in the in the in this the quantitative assessment, we in intentionally focused on the overlap between the advisor evaluation of uh, the risk and the learning analytic tool, the algorithm, so that um, would be a algorithm centric uh, evaluation by the advisor, in a sense, if it makes sense. Uh, and would focus only on the risk because of the learning analytic tools, the algorithms that we implemented were uh, uh, optimized on identifying the risk. So it wasn't uh, as much uh, uh, an identification of uh, whether a student is at risk or not, but was, uh, is the student at risk potentially in an enrollment uh, and uh, does uh, what uh, the learning al analytic tools tell us um, overlaps with what the advisors would evaluate by looking at the student record. And so we wanted to kind of limit the scope of the quantification uh, of the overlap. I just wanted to add to that that one of the things that we found was um, advisors had indicated a few things in the survey that you saw the different categories we had. There were some things that advisors indicated that they hadn't added into the algorithm, and after doing that, the next version, they're planning on adding some of those things, like withdrawals and incompletes, I think, weren't in it, and so those are being added in. So th some of that back and forth of what the advisors, how the advisor is assessing it and the tool was looking at it is coming in. Yeah, um, I was just wondering, do you have students on campus that don't go visit their advisor before planning their schedule? Because you could do some interesting stuff looking at, would you have predicted them to be at risk as an advisor? Would the system have predicted them to be at risk? And did they actually fail? Yeah, so for in our unit, all new students, the first year, they have to see an advisor every semester but into the second year they don't anymore so you could do that with some pockets of the students so that might be something you could do for part of the continuing students but not for all of them but yeah that could be useful yeah, and i mean there'd be a selection bias because if you're less motivated to go see the absolutely advisor, so. right but right it still could be interesting yeah okay. in term i heard you mention that in terms of adoption um that one of the potential benefits might be that advisors would see error reduction. Um, what I'm wondering is, how many other systems are your advisors currently using in a general work day and in their work with students? And in terms of adoption, um, as you see this, as, your work as you see your work going forward, um, what kinds of strategies do you see for either, I mean, aligning those systems or making, you know what I'm saying, building this so they have w only one or two places to go. One of the, we've already gone through at uh, my institution a pretty heavy lift just to get them to use a system that will enable them to take notes. And we're trying to build other features in, but they're saying I have so many places just to try to go in the virtual environment, I don't even know how to do this. So in what ways maybe it's not part of the study, but it does affect Right, what like, they're doing and how they appreciate uh, this. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we do have a note uh, system that's electronic that's used for all of the IU schools, and there are uh, numerous of them. Um, and it also has a filtering system, but this is outside from that. Um, and there are, there's also, there are a couple other different things. Uh, um, actually, I feel like we're, re recently we've been reducing the number rather than increasing them. Um, but that's a conversation that we, we've had is how can we 
we add this to our dashboard. Our trick right now is that our note system with the other dashboard is used at all of the other IU institutions, and this is just built on our institution, so we, it's hard, how do we add that into that? Um, but we do have an idea for a student engagement roster system that's also being developed of maybe adding it in there. Um, right now we have a lot of things in Tableau in reports and this is within that. Um, but yes, I think that is an issue and that's something that we've begun to talk about is how do, how do we incorporate that in a useful way. If I can add that with, uh, we're actually uh, taking uh, steps to um, centralize uh, the uh, location of the, the predictive uh, analytics so that they can uh, in be incorporated into the tools that advisors are already using uh, in a more, uh, um, uh, in a less dispersed way. And, uh, and but uh, so, so the, the implementation at the institutional level um, is, is a, a second step from uh, uh, what we're being achieving here. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. If perhaps, perhaps I can ask one then. I mean, um, you've you've shared very honestly the performance of the machine, as well as the performance of the humans with respect to the students who actually turned out to be safe or at risk. And clearly, humans aren't perfect at this. Uh, so it's going to be pretty tough for a machine to be really good. But I mean. If we look at the kind of agreements there, and there was another table in your paper that looks at the actual student outcomes, there's a lot of errors, right? There's a lot of false positives, a lot of false negatives. So there's obviously you know, lots of work to do to try and get build the trust that an advisor will have in the, the output. So uh, can you comment a bit on, you know, after this iteration, and of course it's, this is a tough challenge, what, what level of trust is there? You talked about the epistemological differences between how a human makes an assessment and how you know a machine learning algorithm does. You know, I mean, ultimately, this will not get used by advisors if they don't really trust the output. So, where where are you on that journey? I can give you the analyst perspective first, and then maybe Adrian uh, gives you the <laughs> the advisor's perspective. From from our perspective, um, we've been very honest. Um, about the limitation of the tool and, uh, and the data we used. And uh, we, we um, work very hard uh, to say uh, what this uh, algorithm tells us uh, might be wrong and, uh, and has limitation. And so uh, advisors also look at the prediction uh, with a very uh, critical eye and they immediately kept feeding us cases uh, of students who uh, were making any sense in terms of uh, the prediction of a uh, risk. And so th this uh, actually helped us acknowledge uh, the limitations and identify uh, what was missing in uh, the approach we were taking and uh, contributed to improving uh, the algorithms and the data that we were using to produce this algorithm. Hopefully. Uh, and improving also the, the prediction that we were achieving. So. Yeah, and I, wor I worked, ran the groups of advisors that were piloting it and then moving on with it. And um, they, yes, they reported things that were issues, but they also found it as more accurate and that the way that we, they were being shown the information led them to easily decide whether they thought that that was accurate or not, even though their assessment might, might not be accurate. Um, but one thing that helped is that we have an advisor that's been with us probably longest. She's won these big awards uh, from our national advising organization. And she reported afterwards that it was 90% accurate and that it picked up a lot of students that she had thought weren't at risk that ended up doing poorly. And so when someone like that says it, it helps others think, oh, well, if Connie thinks that this is you know, more accurate than what she was guessing after all those years of knowledge, it kind of helped other people accept it. But that doesn't mean they're always going to believe what they see and some are going to think about it differently. But it, it has, there definitely is more understanding of what it is they're seeing. That's great. Okay, that's a very nice example of the machine people working well with the human people uh, and trying, trying to bridge that gap. Let's thank the Indiana team again. Thank you.